logistics starts to get a little complicated with these new rules in the CBI, and so it's something to definitely pay attention to. Um, where that relates to what the uh, allies could do on the first turn is that um, it's possible um, for the allies to launch, uh, because they're going first here, uh, a bit of a spoiling attack. Um, if you look, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do control A on these two units to activate them. Um, so if I were to activate these two units and um, run a ground offensive, um, I might, for example, throw those two units against Mandalay. Uh, and a good rule of thumb in this game is that when you're um, when you're running a ground combat, um, two to one is reasonably good odds. If you're much less than two to one, it starts to get really risky. Even at two to one, it's somewhat risky because um, the range of potential outcomes on the combat chart is um, pretty hairy. Um, but um, two to one is a good um, set of odds to be going for. So in this case, um, that's about what we've got if we throw these two cores against the Japanese. If the Japanese core were defeated and thrown back, um, then at this point, the 2012 over here is going to be out of supply because it it's now more than... Um, four movement points. It's it's a half by strat route to that hex, and then two more to the hex northeast, and two more. So it's actually four and a half movement points. So this guy would be out of supply up here. So that's kind of a nasty thing that the allies could do early on is um, uh, is to launch a spoiling attack like that. Um, and let's actually just sort of take a quick look at at how you would do something like that um, using um, and I'm gonna yep how often do you check out of supply so so actually you check supply um, at a bunch of specific points in time um, so for example um, you you check supply um, when you want to activate someone it is the most common um, point in time um, so, if these guys were here uh, and the Japanese wanted to run an operation, at that moment in time, they would look at the 2012 army here and say, ah, this guy is now out of supply, so we can't activate him. Um, the um, And that goes for activating for an offensive as well as activating for a, a reaction move. Um, you um, you also will check supply um, for attrition purposes at the very end of the turn. Um, so those are probably the sort of three most important points to be checking supply. And and once you uh, have checked supply at the beginning of an offensive uh, to activate a unit, um, the the other key point is that that unit is then considered to be in supply. Um, for the duration of that operation. So toenails, as you recall, is our um, FO card. We can play it at any time. Um, the nice thing about it, if you look at it, uh, it can activate any HQ, which means we could use it to activate SEAC here. Um, and it's got a logistics value of four. Um, so that means that SEAC would be able to activate five units because when you run an operation, to determine how many units you can activate, you basically look at the logistics value of the offensive card, if you're using it as an event, um, plus the efficiency rating of the HQ, which is the white number inside the red square, so the 1 for SEAC. So 4 plus 1 gives SEAC 5 units to activate for toenails. Um, and just um, to look at it the other way, even though you probably would never use this card as an OC, um, if you did use it as an OC, SEAC could activate three units because its OC value is two uh, and, and the efficiency rating is one. So the, a lot of other cards you might use, particularly non-military event cards, you might use for the OC value, in which case, again, it's just you take the OC value plus the efficiency rating. Here we can activate five units. We've also got an artillery bonus, which gives us plus one the die roll modifier in ground combat. Um, since we're going to do a big ground combat, plus one is always nice to have. Uh, so uh, if we look at 
what might happen here. We could activate these two guys, and then we've got three more. Um, so here's where it starts to get interesting. Um, one of the things that could happen, and let, let me just sort of, sorry, before we go there, let me go back for a second and talk about the other piece of the OC value is that even if you're using this card as an event, um, the two OC value still determines the movement that you can um, undertake as part of that operation. So, for example, um, naval units can move, in this case, two times five for ten movement points. Uh, air units can move two legs of whatever their range is, and ground units can move two movement points. Um, and so two is good um, because there's very little clear terrain on the map. Um, there's a bit of it in North India, but as you can see, most of the CBI is either jungle or rough, which takes two movement points. And so um, two OC value cards are good for launching ground defenses because it gives you enough to at least move one hex. So um, with that, we know that these two units can get into Mandalay because it'll cost them two movement points, and they've got exactly two movement points. Um, the other challenge we have is that we know that this guy over here, and I'm going to activate him just to, whoops, let's try that again. There we go. Um, so if that Japanese um, 15th Army there were to, were to react, um, he's got two movement points to react with because this OC value works for reaction in the same way it works for the offensive player. Um, so this guy could react and move two into that hex, um, which is not what we want because we really don't want a one-to-one -one attack there because that makes things really messy and risky. Uh, so the way to prevent somebody from being able to do that is to basically pin them. Uh, and to pin them, you need to attack them. And so there's a couple ways we could attack them. We could attack them by ground. So, for example, we could attack we could activate that Chinese unit, and the Chinese unit could move in here and conduct an attack there. That would pin the 15th Army. Or, um, if we wanted to, we could activate, for example, this LRB unit um, the, that's sitting over here in Dhaka. Uh, and he could just sit right where he is, and he's got a range of six, so he could hit the 15th Army from Dhaka. So either a ground attack or an air attack would pin the 2012 and prevent it from being able to react into um, the Battle of Mandalay. So let's assume for the moment that we want to activate the LRB um, to pin that guy. And by the way, you can also, one of the nice things is um, you can place battle hex markers um, to show where you want to attack. Um, and there we go. Um, and you can actually move them a little bit out of the way if you want to see what the units are. So we've activated three units, the two ground units and the LRB, and we have got two more activations left because we had five total. Um, and so we need to think about what we might want to do with those other two activations. Um, the... Um, Whenever you're running an offensive, it's good to think about how the other guy could be reacting. And actually, let's pull this down a little bit. Um, so if you look, if you mouse over, well, it doesn't get any bigger than this, really. Um, but you'll see next to the big two at the top, it says OC2, EC4. Those are the dice rolls um, needed to make uh, a, a, an intercept roll when rolling for intelligence. Um, and so what that means is we're using this as the event, so we use the EC number. And that means that if the Japanese roll a 4 or less, and remember 0 in this game is, is low, so if they roll a 0 through 4, um, they're going to have uh, intercept as the intelligence condition. Um, and actually, it, they're going to need, uh, it's going to be even better than that because um, you'll notice this guy here, um, that I just flagged, the 2210, that's the, uh, what is that? That's the 5th Air Division. Um, he's got a zone of influence um, of two hexes, so that extends up to the Mandalay hex, and by moving from, and actually this guy right here, 
at uh, Akiab is in his zone of influence. And if you either leave or enter or move through a zone of influence, which is exactly what he's doing, uh, that gives uh, the defender a two die roll modifier benefit when rolling for intelligence. So instead of needing a four or less um, to get intercept here, the Japanese are going to need six or less. So that's basically going to give them a 70% chance of rolling an intercept and only a 30% chance of a surprise attack for us. Um, so we have to assume they're going to be able to intercept and of course if we get surprised that's nice but um, but if they can intercept then I'm going to go ahead and just move these guys into the hex for the moment. Let's say they move there. At this point, we have no um, air naval coverage over that hex. Um, and so if, for example, the, um, uh, the Japanese were to activate this guy and attack us, um, he could actually um, do a step damage uh, against our ground guys because one of the things normally air and naval fight air and naval in the air naval combat phase and then ground fights ground in the ground combat phase but if um if one side has is the only side with air and naval um, then that side can directly attack uh, the other side's ground units before ground combat uh, and we really don't want that here because we don't want to give up a free step um, to the um, Japanese air. So we've got two choices, basically. Um, one choice is we could uh, activate, um, for example, an air unit. Um, and so let's say this SEAC air unit here. Um, and we would want to get him within two hex range of Mandalay. You'll notice he's got He's got a range of four. The white four there is his extended range. The black two is his um, regular range. So he can actually fight because it's not parenthesized. He can fight at an extended range of four, um, but at half value. Uh, to be able to fight at full value, he has to be within two. So he, he could either fly to Dhaka or to Akiab, or he could fly up here or two. And any of these bases that are within two of Mandalay would be fine. Um, so we could activate him, and he can move two legs, and so two le that's really two legs of four. So he's got plenty of range here. That's not a problem at all. Um, so we could activate this guy and have him fly cover um, over Mandalay, uh, and then we'd still have one more unit that we could activate to fly cover with him if we wanted to. Uh, or the other option would be that we could um, actually go and attack the that their division in Rangoon, because if we attack it in Rangoon, um, then we pin it there and prevent it from um, doing anything. And if you look at how we might, um, so let me put SEAC back for a second. Um, if you look at how we might uh, go about attacking Rangoon, um, SEAC actually from Akiab could hit Rangoon. That's definitely one option. Um, if we come over here, um, this British battleship can't quite make it. If you count, um, one trick is you'll notice that the northwest um, little strip of coast in Rangoon is a lighter color blue. That means that naval units, um, naval movement is prohibited in that hex uh, from that direction. Um, so the, the war spite can't get into Rangoon that way. He has to go the long way around, which is down here and in, and unfortunately that's more than the 10 movement points he's got um, on a 2OC, so he can't make it. But the Indomitable could come and hang out off the coast here and um, could attack Rangoon. So, um, so let's just say, for the sake of argument, that that's what we decided to do. Um, that we activate all these guys here. Um, so now we've got five guys activated. Um, we've got two ground units that moved in. We've got the LRB up here that's attacking the 15th Army. And we've got the air unit and the CV that are attacking Rangoon. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and assume um, that the 
Japanese made a successful intelligence roll. In other words, they rolled six or less um, on, a, on a ten sided die. So they now have intercept as opposed to surprise. And um, so let's look at really quickly how intercept works. Um, first of all, one of the battle hexes needs to be within the range of uh, the HQ. Let's put up the range. So obviously, all the battle hexes, and in fact, there's actually three battle hexes here, right? So let's uh, add this guy. So we've actually got three battle hexes. They're all within range, but only one needs to be. Um, if there are several battle hexes and only one of them is in range of the HQ, that's fine. That's all it takes is one battle hex being in range uh, of a um, supplied HQ for that HQ to then be able to activate units in reaction. Um, then you got to figure out how many um, units can be activated in reaction. So we go back to the OC value of the card. So for Operation Toenails, the OC value is 2. Uh, South also has a um, an efficiency rating of 1. So South can basically activate 3 um, units in reaction if it wants to, up to 3. Um, one, the, to be activated in reaction, a unit, first of all, has to be in supply. Uh, you have to be able to trace an activation path from the HQ um, to the unit that you want to activate in reaction. And the reacting unit also has to be able to participate in the battle. So that's a key point, is you can't activate somebody in reaction just to move it. It actually has to be able and in range to participate in the battle. Um, so if we zoom out just a little bit, um, there really are no Japanese naval forces over here. Um, so we're really just looking at air forces that could be activated. And if you look, essentially, so let me, I'm going to activate this guy down here for a quick second to show you. So this is the guy at the 3rd Air Division at Palembang. So he's not going to be able to make it. And let's just show you how the um, range works. So this is 4. So he's, like all standard land-based air, he's got an extreme range of 4, an extended range of 4. So that's one leg there. Um, that's another leg there. It's only three movement points, but there is no base further, so he can't. So he's got to stay within his four range. So that's his second leg, and then actually he could. He's um, he is three away from um, Rangoon, and he's four away from Mandalay. So he could participate at um, half strength if he wanted to. Um, the other candidate here is this guy, um, because he is naval air, and one of the cool things that's new with the um, uh, reprint edition is the colors have changed to make it easier to see what's ground, or what's army and what's um, navy, both for uh, the allies and for the Japanese. So the Japanese navy and the Japanese naval air are all white. It really helps in ISR. Um, so. Uh, he cannot fly to Rangoon because Rangoon is a battle hex and you can't fly into a battle hex, but he could fly to Bangkok here. And Bangkok puts him within um, three of Rangoon so that um, he can participate in that battle at full strength. Uh, and if we look at this guy over here, if we were to activate him, because remember we've got three total units we could activate in reaction, one, two, three, four, five, puts him here, um, and he also can't go to Rangoon. He could potentially fly up here if we wanted him to, but he could also fly down here. Um, and by the way, stacking um, only applies at the end of an operation. So one of the things you can do is you can overstack during an operation as long as you are correctly stacked completely at the end of the operation. Um, sorry, the white units the are white Navy. Units are army. Yep, the yellow yeah. units are Army and the white units are Navy. So actually, um, you just did a great thing, which is um, you reminded me um, that we're, if we go up here, you can see we're under ISR. 
So we can't legally activate the naval units in this um, uh, in this reaction. Um, so we need to send these guys um, directly to jail uh, and deactivate them. So ISR applies both when running an offensive and when um, running um, a reaction. So really, uh, the only unit that at this point can react uh, is this Army Air unit that we moved to Bangkok. And he is actually at half, uh, uh, at half strength. So uh, having him participate is really not going to make any difference in the outcome in the sense that 27 strength points as opposed to 22 strength points um, is going to get exactly the same results um, on the table. So, and then that's one of the things, this game is full of puzzles. And so one of the puzzles is looking at, you know, trying to optimize combat. Um, and there are, there are several pieces to optimizing combat. Um, if I, if I pull up the combat table, do you guys see me doing that? Or do you need to pull up your own combat table? Um, if you can't see it, just go ahead and pull up, uh, uh, click on charts and yeah. So if you just click on charts near the top, uh, and then select combat results chart, which is the furthermost. Yeah, we need tab, to pull up. You'll our... see. So all the charts from the game are here. Um, but, um, but what you can see is there's quite a range. So for example, in air naval combat, you know, the low end of the range is doing one quarter damage. You could also do one damage or you could uh, half damage or you could do um, full damage. So what that refers to is um, the allies, for example, have 20 here uh, attacking the Japanese. Um, so full damage, meaning one, would be 20 points of damage against the Japanese. A half would be 10 points of damage and a quarter would be five. Uh, because the Japanese defense strength is 10, 20 points of damage actually um, will kill it because I'm going to flip it here so you can see. Um, each side has, uh, most units have two steps. Um, and when you're taking damage, um, you take damage per step. So, so basically 10 hits will cause that step to be lost and you flip him and another 10 hits will cause it him to be eliminated and by the way because he is a yellow dot unit um, basically all the units that start the, the game on the map are yellow dot units pretty much for both sides and those units can't be replaced and um, it is for the japanese for the most part you know they're elite good units um, so not only can the units not come back, but the units can't even take replacement. So once an elite unit has taken a step loss, it can't be replaced back up to full strength. Uh, anyway, um, so figuring out what a one X or a half X or a quarter X result does to the other guy based on the number of steps you have and what his defense strengths are is one piece of optimizing the combat puzzle. Um, there's another piece of it, uh, which has to do with the fact that um, there, there's a there's a rule buried in there in the combat results and in, in the hit allocation um, that says that you can't eliminate uh, any units until all units have first been reduced. Um, so that starts to get tricky as well when you're starting to think about hit allocation because if you have um, some full strength units and some reduced units in the combat, then um, then the full strength units will all have to be hit first before any of the reduced units can be eliminated. Um, then the third piece of combat optimization is um, what's usually referred to as air parity. I'll just do a really quick sort of summary of how the air parity rule works. What it basically says is that um, you can only hit as many enemy units participating from outside the battle hex as you have units participating in the battle that are capable of fighting at range. Um, so units capable of fighting at range are 
either air units or CVs. Um, units that aren't air units or CVs are basically surface forces. Surface forces have to be in the battle hex to do any damage, but carriers or air units could potentially be in the battle hex. So let's do this. Let's do a quick example here. And even though he can't make it, we're going to steal the war spite and pretend that he's actually, let's pretend that the war spite is coming to do this attack and he's the only guy attacking this guy. Okay. Forget about the air. Um, Cause now we can play with parody. So if it's the war spite coming to Rangoon to attack this guy, then what I can do is, uh, so actually first off, the units in the battle hex don't necessarily have to be activated to fight. So I could choose to just leave him in the battle hex, not activate him so that I could activate somebody else if I wanted to, and that air unit would, would still fight. But if the war spite were coming after him, the air unit would actually want to activate and get out of the hex because, let's say, he comes down here. Okay, for starters, he's at extended range, so he's going to be halved to 11. But if it's just this fifth air division against the war spite, um, the war spite has no air capability. Um, the fifth air division is fighting at range. You can only hit as many units at range who are fighting at range as you have capable of ranged combat. The allies have no units capable of ranged combat right now, so they can't hit the 5th Air Division. Um, if the 5th Air Division were in the hex, um, the air parity rule doesn't apply because basically it only applies when you're fighting from range. So anyway, hopefully that helped unconfuse things a little bit relative to air parity. Um, air parity and the requirement to flip, that is reduce all units before any units can be completely eliminated. Those two, they're fairly straightforward rules, but the application of them is somewhat complicated. And so getting good at seeing situations where you can leverage those in combat is one of the things that's important to do. Um, to get good at the game. Um, in this case, it doesn't really matter because there are two uh, range-capable units on the Allied side, and there are two range-capable units on the Japanese side, so each side can hit both units on the other side. So let's just do a quick um, what might happen here. You do air-naval combat first, so let's take a look. Let's do battle B first. That's an air naval combat because it's an LRB attacking a ground unit. There is no air in defense of the ground unit. Um, the LRB has a combat value of four. Um, so it normally wouldn't be able to hit this army, which has a defense value of 12, because normally to be able to, to actually do a step of damage, you have to be equal to or greater than the defense value. So he would norm, he would, he would need um, 12 points of damage, which you can't get. But air naval combat has something called a critical hit. And you can crit ground units as well. And basically it's on a natural nine. Um, and so if we roll to see what happens, we'll just roll a d10 there. And we roll a one, which is not a crit. So um, essentially there's no damage. Um, the 2012 gets away unscathed and it can't it can't hit back because it's a ground unit and it can't hit an air unit. And so battle B is over and essentially nothing happened except that the 15th army was pinned there. Um, if we then go to battle C, which is the Rangoon battle, um, we've got uh, basically 20 for the allies and 27 for the Japanese. Uh, I'm going to roll two dice, and the first, uh, the normal convention is the attacker's die is first, so I'm going to roll two dice, and the attacker's die will be first. So that's a zero for the allies and a five for the Japanese. So a zero for the allies is a quarter. A quarter of 20 is five, so they, we, we basically do no damage. So the 20 is coming from the SEAC air right here, um, and from the CV Indomitable right here. So so, the so 20, it's the, it's the, the leftmost number on both of those out. is the um, attack value. So 10 plus 10 gives us 20, and we rolled a 0, which if you pull up the 
combat chart, a zero to oh, two okay. is a one quarter result. So it's one quarter of the total attack factors involved. So a quarter of 20 is five. And because we need both of these units have a defense strength of 10. And actually, if you recall the, um, uh, the hit allocation rule, we can't hit the reduced unit down in Bangkok um, yet because there's still a full strength unit in the battle. So uh, if we had done um, 10 points of damage instead of 5, in other words, if we had rolled a half X result, um, which is a 3, 4, or 5, if we had rolled a 3, 4, or 5, we could actually um, flip this guy here. And we'd have to flip him because we, we couldn't kill the other guy while he was still full strength. But we missed. Um, we got a quarter X, so nothing happened there. Um, the Japanese got a five. A five is a half X result. So um, that's um, half of 27 is 13 and a half. Um, you round up. Um, so that's 14 um, factors. Uh, and so that's enough to hit either the SEAC Air, which has a defense of 10, or the CV, which has a defense of 12. And normally, um, when going after the Allies, the Japanese always want to hit Navy if they can because the Allies have many more air re uh, replacement steps than they have naval replacement steps. So we'll say thank you with a, with a 14. Um, we hit, and actually, uh, so, so I lied before when I said having the extra air unit wasn't going to make a difference because actually it does. Because uh, if we if we were only 22, 22 halved is 11. 11 is not enough to hit the Indomitable. Um, it's enough to hit the SEAC at 10, but it's not enough to hit the Indomitable that needs 12. So um, so thinking through, you know, looking carefully at if I add this extra unit or if I do this this way, um, what's the impact going to be is one of the ways that you can really obsess when you're prepping for your battles. But at, at the more you play, the more you get to do that without even thinking. You get to a place where you can do it without even thinking about it. Um, so anyway, we had um, uh, we had one hit against the CV there, and now we're at, at our and that combat is over. There's no ground combat there. There's a ground unit in the hex, but um, there's no ground combat that can occur uh, because um, we had air naval combat here, and there are no allied ground units to fight a ground battle. So let's just delete that. So that battle hex is done. And now we're back to battle A, and this is strictly a ground battle. There's no air involved on either side of this one. Um, and let's take a quick look. Um, so we've got 36 on the allied side, and 18 for the Japanese, and we need to look at modifiers. So pull up your charts again and look at the ground combat results table. And under the modifiers, what you will see is that uh, there's a minor minus two if the defender is in mixed, and minus one uh, if he's in jungle. Um, and um, because we're jungle at Mandalay, there's going to be a minus one for terrain there. That minus one for terrain is going to be offset by the plus one that we get if you go back to the artillery support on the toenails card. Um, that's a sort of special bonus for the card. Um, so that plus one will offset the terrain. So basically, um, there's not going to be any um, die roll modifiers in this combat at all. It's just going to be a straight roll. So I'm going to roll two dice. Um, and again, the allied roll will be first. And that's a 4-4. Four, four. And if you look at the chart, uh, a 4-4, four, four, a, a 4 is a 1 result. So the ground CRT is fairly similar to the naval CRT, except that you do more damage. Um, it works pretty much the same way, but you just do more damage in terms of a multiple of your um, combat value. So both sides do 1x damage. Um, so if we look at, let's pull this guy out. Um, so 36 um, against the Japanese, and the, the, the combat is always simultaneous here. Combat's always simultaneous except in air naval when one side has surprise. If one side has surprise in air naval combat only, um, that side gets to apply hits first before the other side fires back. Uh, so 36 basically first flips this guy 
and now we still have 24 left, and 24 is plenty to kill 12 twice over, so we would basically send this guy to the Deadpool where he's available for replacement, because all those ground units are replaceable. Um, the replacements, by the way, the ground replacements all come out of China. Um, so we essentially rendered that army completely ineffective, um, and uh, it hit us back for 18. Uh, 18 is enough to do one step of damage here, um, so that's enough to flip this guy. So in this case, so that wraps up the operation. Basically, we're done with the combat, and now it's time to do um, post-battle movement. Um, and in this case, we got off reasonably well. Um, we destroyed the Japanese army for not too much damage in return. We didn't really like the CV hit, but that's life. Um, so if we look at post-battle movement, um, post-battle movement is, um, let me get rid of the battle marker. Ground units uh, do not conduct post-battle movement um, normally. The only time they conduct post-battle movement is if, you, if the operation was an amphibious assault and the amphibious assault failed, then the assaulting ground units have to PBM um, back to a port. But other than that one instance, ground units will not do post-battle movement. They just they stay where they are. Um, but air and naval units have to um, post-battle move. And the reacting player does post-battle movement first. So in this case, we'll just keep things simple. And actually, what we'll do is we'll PBM him over to Medan. Um, and what I'll do is I'm going to show you really quickly at a higher scale. I'm going to turn on these are Japanese air zones of influence. You'll see that an air unit at Medan um, or an air unit over here in Java um, successfully cuts communication between Australia and the CBI. It is possible if communication is not cut for somebody like this first Australian Corps down in Darwin um, on a strap move to motor all the way from Australia over to the CBI. Um, so one of the things that in the 43 scenario the Japanese like to try and do is get an air unit someplace where it can block that um, from happening to make it harder for the allies to reinforce the CBI. Um, so let's say he did post-battle movement back there. And the Japanese says, I'm done with my post-battle movement. So it's now the offensive player's turn. And let's send this guy back to any port within range. So post-battle movement, same movement allowance as you had when you, for, when you moved before the battle. So in other words, with the 2OC, um, Naval units can move 10 hexes to get into the battle, and then they can move 10 hexes back home after the battle. Air units can move on a 2OC. Air units can move two legs to get to the battle and two legs after the battle. Um, and it's the same for both the offensive and the reacting player. So Madras is well within range. Um, the SEAC air, um, let's say, the SEAC air might... Well, what does he want to do? I think he's actually going to stay in Dhaka. So that's the end of post-battle movement, and that's basically an operation finished there. Um, that that actually went reasonably well for the Allies. Um, it's a risky attack. Um, I will just point out that, um, for example, if in the ground combat, um, if the Allies... Um, only get, let's say, a half X result, which they have a 30% chance of, um, they would only flip um, the Japanese unit, not kill it. And if the Japanese gets a one and a half or a two X result, um, that army could kill two or three uh, ground steps of the allies instead of just the one that they kill. Um, so it's an interesting kind of preemptive spoiling attack here, um, and if it works, um, it sets the Japanese back. If it doesn't work, um, it can actually end up giving the Japanese a bit of a leg up. Um, so it's definitely one of those things to think carefully about. 
Uh, if, go ahead. Yep. So if the so if the Allies flip the Japanese unit and ah, sorry, uh, no. Together. So what happens is right. great question. Um, and let's pull um, let's pull the guy back out. So if I go to the dead pile. And by the way, if you look in the dead pile here, which is that little X over two counters just to the right of the uh, of the U.S. flag hand, um, if you open that, you'll see most of the stuff that's dead so far is all yellow dot stuff that can't come back. But let me bring this guy on. So let's let's say for a second that in this case um, we got a different outcome. Um, if the uh, if the Allies had gotten only a half X result, that would be 18. Uh, 18 is enough to flip this guy, but uh, once you once you burn 12 of the 18, you only have six left, which is not enough to get the second step. So on an 18, you just flip this. So there's a one step loss against the Japanese and a one step loss against the Allies. Uh, in ground. The, the determination of the victor is important, and it works differently in ground combat from air naval. In ground combat, the victor is determined based on who lost the most steps. Essentially, the person who, who loses the most steps in ground combat loses the combat and has to retreat. In the case of a tie, the defender holds the hex. So in this case, it would be a tie um, because there was one step loss on each side. So basically, the um, the allied units would go back where they came from, uh, and and the position would look like this. Uh, if um, let's say uh, I'm going to flip him, let's say the allies did one step of damage, but the Japanese did no damage, um, because the Japanese rolled a half x as well. Then the Japanese have lost the combat, and the um, the Japanese could end up retreating one of these two places, basically. They couldn't retreat over here because there was another combat over there. Um, so, so you don't, um, you only have units stacked in the same hex during the actual combat. Um, once combat's over, somebody has to own the hex and the other guy has to retreat out. Um, yep. Um, the, um, and let's put him back in the Deadpool for now. Um, in air okay. naval combat, um, it's not the the winner is not based on steps. Uh, the winner is based on uh, the total strength remaining at the end of the combat. So if we look at uh, and and normally it doesn't matter unless you're conducting an amphibious assault. So in this last combat, if you look at what we had, we had the Allies had 15 strength points left, and the Japanese didn't have any losses, so they had 27. So technically, the Japanese won that combat. Um, but it's it's really only going to matter um, if you're conducting um, an amphibious assault, because what happens in, in an amphibious assault is that the uh, the the amphibious assault can only go forward on the ground uh, if the offensive player won the air naval combat. If the, if the reacting player won the air naval combat, then the assumption is that the assaulting forces were turned back, and basically you have to you have to PBM them back to a, a base. Uh, and so at, at that point, it becomes really important when you're conducting an amphibious assault to look at how many factors you can bring and how many factors the other guy might be able to bring in reaction and figure out what your what your chances are of success. Um, so that is um, that's one thing that the allies could do on um, uh, on their first card play if they want is to launch sort of a, a preemptive attack over here to disrupt um, the Japanese somewhat.